Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Armor podcast. As usual, I'm your host Lavarius, and in this week's show we will be taking a deep dive into the spooky world of Bubble Ghost. You're probably thinking this is quite an odd one to pick, but we don't do many puzzle games and it just intrigued me seeing the title, so I've done my best to do some digging and see what I could find and I hope you enjoy what we managed to uncover. But before we jump into that, there is some Amiga news to cover this week. The first one is an odd news item this week, one that popped up on my Twitter feed. As you've probably all gathered by now, I don't know much about Amiga hardware. This is a game show I guess after all, but I'll happily watch anything that's Amiga related, especially if it's interesting or it's about something I've not seen before. Chris Edwards has made a post about an Amiga DDS2 tape drive backup system. I know it's bugger all use today, but this was high-end tech back then and it must have cost a fortune at the time. He spends absolutely ages setting it all up and trying it out with a few tapes, explaining how it all works in tons and tons of detail, which I'm sure all you tech heads really love. I had a good look, but there aren't any other vids like this over on YouTube, and I know it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I know we have a lot of hardware listeners on the show, so I suspect a lot of them have no idea this thing even existed. You might still even be able to buy one on eBay. All of the parts and model numbers are shown in the video, so if you're interested in this sort of thing or want to learn more, just follow the link in the usual place. Shock horror, but our next item isn't really Amiga news. I've always been a big fan of the LucasArts games, and I sort of stumbled across a Facebook post about a sequel for Day of the Tentacle. There is a decent Amiga port out there already, and I'm sure we will do an episode on that one day, but for now, I'm betting this sequel has slipped a lot of people by. Let me share the blurb from its website. Return of the Tentacle Prologue is a fan project and the unofficial sequel to the iconic adventure game Day of the Tentacle. Purple Tentacle is back and tries to conquer the world and then slave humanity once more. The three friends, Bernard, Laverne and Hoagie, make their way back to the mansion of the mad scientist Dr. Fred, where time travel should help save the world. Hunt down megalomaniacal tentacles, have bizarre conversations and solve crazy puzzles. Bernard, Hoagie and Laverne roam hand-drawn locations filled with elaborately animated characters and atmospheric music and sounds. We've done everything possible in order to capture the atmosphere and the humour of the old classic and carry it into the 21st century. Pleased to say it is amazing and the script is really, really good. It's still done with that classic 2D graphic style, so there's no fancy 3D updates here, so don't be worrying. It's free to download, but I don't know how long it's going to be up for, so grab it whilst it's still available. Legal threats and takedowns are always possible, so again, I've no idea how long it'll be up there. Follow the link in the show notes to go and give it a try. This is a PC game, not an Amiga one, but again, it's going off the back of that Amiga port, which is really, really good. We've just about done for news this week. I mean, I do come across so much of it that I'm of half a mind that I could probably do a full-blown show with it all. The Amiga is still alive and kicking. That'd be a bit of a ghastly undertaking, though, and we've got enough of that coming with covering Bubble Ghost this week. Yes, it's time to move over to this week's game. Every so often, I will stumble upon a game that I've no idea even existed. After our recent Bubble Bobble episode, I was just rumbling through the pile of ADFs, trying to see what could be a suitable game to cover, when Bubble Ghost caught my eye. It never even occurred to me that it was actually ported from the Game Boy, as I've played that version many, many times before. And I thought it had been ages since we properly covered a puzzle game, if we've even done any at all. There seemed to be a wealth of information about Bubble Ghost, which got my history buff ears a-tingling, so I think we're in for a good episode. 
The publisher for the game was Infograms. They did North and South, which we didn't cover too long ago. Hostages, SimCity, and a few others. It was developed by ERE, who have quite an interesting release schedule themselves on things like Captain Blood, Cult, Purple, Saturn Day, amongst a few others. Now, this did come out in 1988, and it was released on two floppy disks. It was priced at £19.95, and it's a single-player game only. The coder behind it was Stefan Pick, who didn't really work on many titles, something called Full Metal Planet, Outlaw, Wanted, and that's just about it. The graphics were done by two people. First up was Christoph Andriani, who only did Bubble Ghost Plus after this, which we'll talk about in a bit. Mikhail Rowe, who did Captain Blood, KGB, which is a very good Russian point-and-click adventure game, and Spidertronic. The music was also done by Stefan, who for the most part seems to have done the music on all of the games he's been involved with, unless of course I'm reading this wrong. Going over my research notes, it seems that the Amiga conversion was taken from Christoph Andrian's Atari ST version. He didn't have much to do with the port, but was at least on hand to offer advice on any game mechanics they might have had issues with. From interview, it seems that the ST was also his favourite computer of all time. After switching from older 8-bit systems, he managed to get hold of one and really enjoyed using its larger range of colours and of course the fact that it had a mouse to control the games with. Might seem weird to think of this today, but there was a time when the mouse really wasn't as common as it is today and even I've got memories of wishing I had one for my ZX Spectrum. In fact, I've still got some hazy memory of buying one just to play around with Lemmings on my Specky Plus 2. I think that had some sort of packed in art program. Again, that might just be my ropey memory. I'm not entirely sure, but I remember getting something for an 8-bit system. I'm convinced it was a mouse. Bubble Ghost came about because Christoph wished to make a game that wasn't violent in any way and one that would let the player use a mouse solely for controlling the main character. This started out being a way to move a bubble around the screen, but after finding it wouldn't work with a blow dryer, he realised that a ghost could float straight through walls and combining the two, he thought that a bubble ghost would be much better to use. Thinking back to lots of comics he had read growing up, it wasn't long before Kristoff was scribbling down several ghosts in a pad until he found the design he liked best. Most 16-bit titles can take anything from 6 months to a couple of years to complete, but this was all done at a fairly quick pace over just 3 months. Using C with a mix of assembler, it wasn't long before he was able to finish the game and start shopping it around a few publishers. No one would give him the time of day, but thanks to working on karate before, Philippe Ulrich from A recognised who he was and decided to publish the game. Only a few changes were made to the core code that Christoph had done, but for the most part it was left as is. The reception from magazine reviews was generally quite positive and the game sold well enough that just a few years later a sort of remake hit the market. This was called Bubble Ghost Plus and had improved graphics with sounds but didn't change any of the core gameplay. All of the levels are in Bubble Ghost Plus and it's down to personal preference which version you want to play. For this week's episode I've decided to stick to the original as it's much simpler to look at in my eyes and it's a lot more pleasing to play. It's not one that's going to be getting a full show either as it just doesn't do enough to earn a full episode, but probably worth mentioning here because that'll make our Bubble Ghost experience complete. Shortly after release, Infograms came onto the scene and bought out ERE in full. What's weird is, thanks to the high sales, they were actually contemplating a full sequel and tasked Christoph to actually begin working on one, though in typical publisher fashion, they stopped paying his royalties for the first game, and he just gave up on the project. It's such a sorry way to end the story, because it could have easily made a nice, 
series of multiple sequels across many systems for years to come. There really is enough here because it's basically just a puzzle game. It's not unlike par we say Tetris, but the fact is you could get a small team making lots and lots of puzzles and distributing it on discs and cartridge and all the rest of it. There hasn't been any sort of iPhone follow-up either, which is a real shame as I think that could have made the ideal platform, especially for the way that the game controls. There were a fair few ports. It came out on the CPC 464, Apple 2GS, the Atari ST, Commodore 64, good old Nintendo Game Boy, PC, and finally Tandy PC or the IBM PC Junior. The crazy inventor Heinrich von Stinker is dead. Or so we thought until the Night Watchman told us his fantastic tale of the haunting of von Stinker's old castle. Yes, it has been confirmed. Heinrich Spirit, also known as Bubble Ghost, has been blowing a bubble throughout the macabre halls of his ancestral home. Your job is to help Bubble Ghost move the bubble through the 35 rooms of the castle past all the mad inventions of von Stinker. Once the little ghostie makes it through, the hauntings will cease. I wasn't sure what to expect from Bubble Ghost. It's a puzzle game that reminded me more of Incredible Machine more than anything else. The story is as silly and random as it gets. There's no cutscenes or characters in any part of the main game, so what we have in the manual is basically all that you get. The entire game is driven by the mouse, and on loading for the first time, you will be presented with a very stark menu. You can watch a demo, start the game, or have a go at practice mode. This will let you try any stage up to Hall 34, just in case you get stuck during normal play, but it removes the final level. The only way to see that is by reaching the end one by one. The first hall or room, depending on how you see it, has a surround of grey blocks with Bubble Ghost and his bubble floating in the middle of the screen. To the bottom is a colourful ERE sign with reference to the games company, I suppose, and the game's title. You have five lives down there with your score written across a small black bar. You can also see a red bonus status bar, and that can be seen below all the text at the bottom, which shrinks the longer and longer you stay in the room, reducing your overall bonus points if you manage to make it through. There's no time limit to each hall, so you are free to do as you please. Back to the play area now. To the right is a small chamber filled with moving gripping claws. Not something you need to tackle, but a good example of the type of traps and puzzles that you need to get past later on in the game. Being a single screen game, the aim is quite simple. Blow the bubble past every obstacle and escape to the next room, making sure not to pop the bubble or hit any of the walls. The mouse is your main method of control with left click to turn bubble goals clockwise and then right click to counter that. Tapping space will make him blow a bit of hot air and the longer you hold it then the more reach it will have. Think of it as effectively holding his breath to send it flying further. Some of the gaps can be quite tricky to work your way around so learning how to blow the correct way should be on everyone's mind. Blow too much and you start coughing, turning red. That means you will have to wait for Bubble Ghost to get his breath back, but it's only a brief respite before it comes back in full. Not ideal if the bubble is caught, say, in a draft or heading towards a trap because you need to move quickly. The Bubble Ghost himself sort of acts as a large cursor and effectively floats around like its replacement. You can go anywhere on screen and spin him in both directions with him only moving a slight angle every single button press. You are completely invincible, nothing can do you any harm, so it's always a matter of looking over the room first, planning well ahead and getting right in there to try and solve the puzzles. Scoring points doesn't actually net you any extra lives, and those only pop up when you reach every sixth level, I believe. There's not even any items to pick up or bonuses to use. You are on your own, and only your own bubble-blowing skills will see you through. Even though you are a ghost, that doesn't mean you can't interact with some of the objects. Many a room has candles or switches that, when blown on, will do things like turn on fans, take out candles, or even 
blow on horns to move scary mannequin-like heads out of the way. Yeah, it's very, very odd. Each of the halls is a puzzle in itself, and they can have all sorts of devious tricks applied to them. Some of the worst are diagonal corridors that can take an absolute age to get through. If your bubble touches anything, it pops, so you have to be very slow and careful every single step of the way. I'm going to do my best to go over all of the graphics here, but you need to keep in mind that this is a very basic looking puzzler. It's meant to have lots of puzzles on screen and give you something to get past. The halls all have black backgrounds and Bubble Ghost Plus doesn't even change that, so don't be getting too excited thinking there's more to see on that version. It's not all basic graphics though, hidden away in there is a sneaky picture of the programmer, I think that guy is in Hall 13, which does make for a bit of nice sightseeing, but that's about as extensive as it gets. I have to say that the ghost is basically a hairdryer, but the way he's drawn looks more like a failed version of Casper the Ghost. It has the graphical fidelity of Solitaire and PC, with bricks and objects being more in line with Windows Minesweeper. For the most part, the halls are lined with the same grey bricks, but for a number of the rooms, there can actually be some slime. Ghostbusters 2 was out of the pictures at the same time and I do wonder if that was on the cold as mine when he was coming up with all that green slime. Some of the traps and objects in rooms can change quite drastically. There's all sorts of plants, pipes, spikes and fans. I did see a hangman's noose in one of the halls which might be where Heinrich saw his end. For the most part though, the game gives off a very strong vibe of taking place inside a factory and most of the objects are the only colour variety that you even get to see. The sound is as minimal as it can be. There's no music at all past the opening song, and that's played on loop at the beginning. The Bubble Ghost does have a blowing sound effect, and he does cough when he runs out of air. Beyond that, there's very little effects in the rooms, none of the obstacles make much sound, and it's more of a surprise when they actually do. It's silence in droves, though you might appreciate this with it being a puzzler. That does lead us onto the game's problems. The first is that there just aren't enough levels. It feels like there should have been at least 50 for the price that they were charging. I mean, for the amount of content, it comes across more like a public domain release than what a big studio should actually be doing. It's a budget game at its core, and it's priced almost like a premium at £20. My biggest complaint has to be the lack of music and sound effects. Playing it for a time, I realised that you need to really concentrate more on moving the bubble around, and having lots of noise, I guess, could be a distraction, but at the same time, if I didn't want it, I'd just move the TV. You should, in my opinion, expect a lot more audio, especially from a £20 game. Being invincible is all well and good, but I'm not sure why there aren't any sort of boss puzzle rooms or enemies to deal with. Plenty of traps can move, so having a couple of basic baddies floating around would have made for a more challenging game. The plus release does change the overall game a fair bit, and there is a lot more going on with the level surrounds, but most of the objects aren't much more advanced than what we see in the original. Having to pick between the two versions, I found I like the first one more. There isn't much in it though, whichever edition you go for, you're effectively playing the same game with just different graphics. Moving on to the magazine scores, Zap gave this 88%, CVG 7 out of 10, Amiga Computing 60%, I think that's the lowest, and The Games Machine gave it 78%. For all intents and purposes, this is a maze game, and it's Difficulty put me in mind of playing one of those fairground games where you have to move a metal hoop along a shape bar, hit the wrong section and it beeps like crazy. Thankfully, Bubble Ghost has the controls to match the gameplay and I do love how easy it is to move him around the screen. It's so simplistic and only infuriating if you need to spin the opposite way as there's just a very slight delay as you're moving back the other way. You know, it's time crucial, you might pop the bubble, so it can be a bit annoying. 
You can blow the bubbles from upside down though, and I found that can be a lot easier to wrap your head around rather than spinning the opposite way completely. A mouse click each time is fast enough that it never gets in the way though, so for the most part you should be able to manage fine. I don't think including a practice mode was a very good idea. There's only 35 holes to see and no save or password system. Once you learn your way through the maze, so to speak, you won't really want to go back to any of the holes and it just has very little replayability. There is of course the option to go for a high score, but that's only so interesting. Again, this is a puzzle game, it's not something like Tetris or Columns where you're uh, gathering up them tons and tons of points to get to the top. Anyway, it's a quaint little puzzler, but there's not much to go back to and with just a few more changes, it could have been really, really good. Why they stopped at 35 holes is beyond me and nothing I could read about the game or look at in the research explained any of that. Similar complaints were levelled against it in all the magazine reviews so that explains why they're all so low. Going back to it today and all I kept thinking was just how this could have been the perfect Windows packing desktop game. Something to while away a few hours at work or home just like Solitaire or Ski used to do. This is going to sound a bit odd, but I'm going to recommend the game, except I'll have to recommend the Game Boy version, just because of how well it plays over there and it seems to suit a handheld console a lot more better than it does a home system. The Game Boy Car repeats the puzzles that are in this game right down to the number of rooms, but it has much better music, lots of sound effects, with the added benefit of feeling a lot better to play in your pocket. Before you get too excited though, just keep in mind that it's one of the most expensive games to buy on the Game Boy, thanks mainly to its really small print run, and I suspect that's the same across all of the systems it came out on. That's about the perfect time to finish, I think. That does bring us to a close. I only wished I'd picked a much better game. Anyway, if you'd like to send any messages about anything I've said today, or even on any past shows, you can do so by dropping me a line on lefarious at amigarama.com follow the show on twitter which is at amigaramapod or even come along to the facebook page which is facebook.com slash amigarama there are other ways to support the show as well if you'd like to follow me on patreon you can do so over at patreon.com slash amigarama we do have an ever-growing awesome list of supporters over on there and we always send out a huge thank you to each and every one of them and this week they are 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, Adam Bradley, Darren Coles, Dudley from Yes Design, Gary Hever, Graham Vebke, Glenn Milford from Casual Retro Gamer Weekly, Jason Warns, Laurent Giraud, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Pistol, Premsky, Quentin Barnes, Richard Legg, Richard Pearson, Steve Engeldo, and finally Treble. Thanks for listening and until next time, guys.